Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, our uh, our last speaker uh, from up here is uh, is Barry, who's been around the program a long time, and uh, I'll be interested to hear what he has to say. Barry? It's the noisiest damn closet I ever heard. Um, I think, Linda, one of the reasons we find it difficult to stand where we're told to stand in this, on this platform is because we're standing right in front of you. And uh, I don't like feeling that I'm standing in front of you. <laughs> I like to look at Linda. My name is Barry and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Barry. Hi and welcome to the roundup. I recall a day last, uh, a few um, months ago in the summer, when I looked, I was at a very fashionable little boat, uh, a downing salon down here on Christopher Street called the Silver Dollar, and I <clears throat> looked up and saw an ancient man, uh, you know, creeping along, and I thought to myself, there, but for the grace of God, go I soon, and I tapped on the, tapped on the window and invited him in, turned out to be Richard. Um, he had just lived through the 18th ad, uh, advisory committee meeting for the roundup. He was ready to drink. And then, however, by the end, of, after we had some coffee, Richard decided that even if only four people came, he would stick it out. Richard, look at this. Four people. Um, I also should say, I think, if I'm not gay, for the past 25 years, my beloved housemate and I certainly have been acting out a weird scene. <laughs> I'm sure the people that were in AA when I got there, which is an exceeding number of years ago, are um, whirling in their graves right now, probably a lot of them with delight. And instead of talking very much about my own experience, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience of AA as a whole with gay people, because it really leads us to where we are tonight. And I am sort of a, got to be a sort of eavesdropping footnote in a part of that history, and I will talk about it. This is a marvelous way to wind up uh, my 35th year in AA. Um, There's nothing to it. Um, <laughs> unless you're lucky and die young, you'll be one. An old timer, that is. Um, uh, but before I got to A, it was then 10 years old, and I recall very well. Uh, <laughs> the fellowship itself was just exactly 10 years old when I came in in January 1945. And there were about four gay people that we knew of. Four of us uh, pretty quickly got to know each other. As far as we knew, as far as we knew, one of, one of those was um, a marvelous lesbian, many of you would know. Uh, most of those people are no longer alive. Um, but um, it was spooky. Sometimes we felt we were holding hands and wondering if we were going to make it. Because we saw others coming around and they didn't stay. Uh, and that was scary. I was lucky. I had no notion that I didn't belong here. 
it didn't occur to me I didn't belong. Uh, my first friends in AA assured me I belonged. And uh, I hadn't any doubt this is where I belong. Um, but let me now check back and see what had happened before that. And part of this, uh, I must say, I must give credit to Nancy T., that marvelous Yenta, who uh, is also a historian. Any of you not know Nancy? Anybody in the room doesn't know Nancy? You ought to. Nancy, where are you? Are you here? Huh? She stepped out. All right. Um, I don't blame her. Um, <laughs> in the year two in, uh, in AA, there arrived a man in Akron, Ohio. This is the first AA group. And he said to the people who were there, I'm an alcoholic, all right, and I want to join, but you ought to know something. I have another problem in addition to alcoholism. And it's even worse to stigmatize in alcoholism. And I don't know if you want me to join. So they called a meeting. And um, the three elders of the group got together and had a long confab about this and began to wonder whether they should let this guy in. They said, uh, you know, he might cause trouble. And uh, do we want that kind of person in here? What will people say if that kind of person comes in? Uh... And uh, one of the three who was at this meeting, who was leading this serious meeting about this man, was asked what he thought. His name happened to be Dr. Bob. And Dr. Bob said, well, I keep asking myself, as you know, Dr. Bob was a very religious man, very spiritual man. Dr. Bob said, I keep asking myself, what would the master say? I think we're more afraid of this man, or more afraid of our reputation than we are afraid of what this man might do to us. And I don't think we have any right to ask any question other than, is the guy an alcoholic? Uh, and if you turn to, the, to uh, Tradition 3 in the book, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, you'll read that story. And you'll also read a story in there, and I wonder how many people in the room knew it. I didn't until quite recently. The word queers appears in there. The uh, man in Akron said, uh, will you let me join your group, since I'm the victim of, of something even worse than stigmatizing alcoholism, you may not want me, or will you? And there was the dilemma, and they had their meeting, and the elders uh, looked only at the objections and said, we, we deal with alcoholics only, and so on and so on, while the newcomer's fate was hanging in the balance. Then one of the three spoke in a very different voice, and what we are really afraid of, he said, is our reputation. We are much more afraid of what people might say than the trouble the strange person might bring. And those words, what would the master do, came out. So the newcomer plunged into 12-step work. Tirelessly, he laid a message before scores of people. Since this is a very early group, those scores have since multiplied themselves into thousands. Never did he trouble anyone with his other difficulty. AA had taken its first step in the formation of Tradition 3. There's another story there about somebody else who had another, uh, another bit of trouble getting in. Well, I want to put in a story from my own experience that happened in 1950. A good friend of mine, a woman member of AA, went to Scandinavian countries where she'd wanted to go all her life. And she had a marvelous time in going to AA meetings and was entertained royally. But she never saw a woman alcoholic in all the Scandinavian countries. And on her last night, she said to the men who had been so gallant and who were nice taking her around, I've loved going to your meetings, but I don't see any women members. Do you not have any women alcoholics in um, Scandinavian countries? And... They said, oh, yes, oh, we have dreadful women alcoholics. And she said, well, why are there none in your groups? And they said, well, we haven't been able to find one who would give it the right tone. Uh, that's what they were, wait uh, they were waiting for, a drunk lady, to give the place the right tone. <laughs> um, in, the, in, the, in the section on, on Tradition 3, uh, it goes ahead to say uh, that they kind of began to worry about what, what kinds of people might join AA, and they wondered whether maybe uh, ex-convicts might try to get in, whether queers might try to get in, and on and on and on. The word is there, and you can look it up. And uh, then they said, of course, they finally got around to that tradition, uh, recognizing Tradition 3, and uh, they said anybody can come in that wants to come in who believes he's a member, and that's uh, generally the way it has been in AA, but not officially. Not officially. And I'm not sure that it's AA's fault. I don't think AA has been 
any more repressive, or indeed it has been much less repressive and oppressive toward gay people than some other segments of our society. And I can't stop, I cannot help thinking myself right now, as delightful as it is to see this many people here, how many people we know, how many people we know, all of us in this room, who are out there, I mean in their closets, and I mean two closets. They're in that closet of alcoholism, and they're in that other closet, and I keep thinking how badly closets kill. Alcoholism kills, we know that, we've seen it. And closets, because they're places of hatred and ignorance, closets kill too. And just last week, as you know, three blocks from here, the closet mentality led to death for two of us, people like us. Uh, as much of a celebration as this can be, the fact that we're all here, I hope we make it possible, after this, for a lot of those other people who are still out there in those double closets, to come on down and come on out here where we are. We have a lot of space for them. They don't know it. We can get bigger rooms than these. we got Madison Square Garden. During the end of my first year in AA, 1945, um, <clears throat> some friends of mine who were um, village, village AA members said, uh, by then we were seeing more and more gay people come up and um, come in, and some of the gay people came in and said, we can't stay sober because we don't have a gay AA meeting. Now, at that time in AA history, there were five kinds of meetings. There was the regular open meeting, which, in interestingly enough, was the standard first kind of AA meeting. And you were expected to bring to that meeting all your family. It was for the entire family. Um, there were speakers always at that meeting. And anybody who wanted to come, um, whether alcoholic or not, was welcome. This is your regular open AA meeting. But we had three other, four other kinds of meetings already going on. We had meetings going on for newcomers, specialized interest group, newcomers. And then we had meetings going on for men only. And then we had meetings going on for women only. So we had four other meetings besides the regular meeting going on. Now these fellows came along and said, we think there ought to be a gay meeting. And some of the village members said, that's probably a very good idea. Why don't we ask Bill W. about it? So in those days, knowing Bill was not, was not uh, uh, unusual. Everybody in New York did. There weren't that many of us. And so we had lunch with Bill. And we put the proposition to Bill in 1945. Bill, some of the, we see these fellows coming in who are homosexual, and they don't seem to be able to stay sober. And they seem to think, some of them, that they could stay sober better if they had a, a gay group. Now, what do you think? Do you think it would be a good idea if we set up a gay group? And Bill said, it may be the lifesaver. It just may be a lifesaver. Now, wait a minute. Let's talk about this some more. So we talked about it around the table for a while. And he said, now, how long has anybody here been sober? Well, the longest one, the uh, uh, longest sobriety at the table at that mo moment was about uh, 11 months. And he said, well, uh <laughs> I'll tell you, you've been managed to, managing to stay sober without a gay group, right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, why don't you fellows, just um, those are of you that are interested, try just getting one year under your belts the way it is now, just like you're doing today, and then come back to me and we'll talk about it again. Uh, we never got back to him to have that conversation. We forgot about it. Um, there started there very soon that year, started the same year, Another special interest group, young people in AA. And um, that seemed to siphon off a lot of uh, people who would otherwise maybe have founded gay people in AA. I don't know. Um, this was 1945. In 1949, as those of you who were in New Orleans know, there was a man in Boston, Richard, who um, was at a meeting where Bill was a speaker. And this guy went up to Bill and said, Bill... Um, some of us, uh, there are four or five of us here, they were having a little private gay meeting out behind the state house. And they thought they would maybe want to have a formal gay meeting. So they um, went up to Bill and said, we think maybe we should have, we have a sp another problem, and we think maybe they called it a problem. 
Um, we think maybe we ought to have a special meeting. What do you think? And uh, uh, Bill said, well, what, what do you mean? And they could see the pained look in Bill's face, thinking, oh, dear, another group wants to split away. And, you know, what are they up to? They're going to have Catholic A's and Protestant A's and white A's and black A's and Chinese A's, everything. And um, they were having school teacher A's in one part of the country. Doctor A's were about to get started in 1947. And he said, uh, well, what's this problem? And they said, well, we're homosexual. Bill said, stop right there. Stop right there. Listen, are you guys willing to go to any lengths and do whatever you have to do to stay sober? And they said, yes. And he said, well, if starting a homosexual group is what you need, do it. So as far as he was concerned, they had carte blanche to go right ahead and start a, uh, start a gay group in 1949. They did. They did. They made the mistake of starting it in a sort of run-down hotel, which was a stag hotel. Um, it didn't last. Um, they found other interests, shall we say. Um, now, jump the calendar ahead. In 1973, the, the situation of groups all over the United States was this. United States and Canada, there were groups in all the big cities calling themselves gay groups. Most of the big cities. And a great number of uh, uh, homosexual activists who were also good AA members uh, wanted to be listed in the AA World Directory as gay groups. The General Service Office, which puts out the directory, has no right to decide or not to decide to put anybody in that, uh, direct, in that directory. They need to consult the fellowship, that is, the General Service Conference. So in 1973, they asked the conference to have a discussion on the subject whether or not special interest groups should be listed in, uh, in the, the directory. The thought was maybe these groups were all breaking Tradition 3, because they might exclude some people. And our, our policy of membership has always been inclusive, never exclusive. So should these groups be listed, and it was a quite a, a long discussion, there were two two evenings given to this discussion, um, whether or not the, uh, what should happen when, uh, should there be gay groups listed, and should there be young people's groups listed, stag groups for men, uh, women's groups listed, should all, any of these groups be listed, and it was about 50-50, the, the feeling was in the room, these should not be listed, because they really did violate Tradition 3. However, 50-50 is not a very good, not a very sound basis on which to make a decision, so the group decided, the conference decided, this is too important an issue. We might be fooling with people's lives. Too important an issue to decide in one week. And let's take it back to, to the groups and ask the groups what they think about it and put it on the agenda for next year. So the following year, there was a formal full dress presentation at the General Service Conference of 1974. And I think this question was something like, should special interest groups be listed in the a role directory? Well, Everybody knew that by special interest groups, they meant gay groups. There was no question in anybody's mind about this, and I will never forget that debate. It lasted, it went on, uh, it began um, one afternoon, about 2 o'clock, and at 5.30, they were still going hot and heavy, and the group was, the conference was divided. Everybody at the conference is allowed to talk, and you can't shut anybody up. They have three minutes at the microphone, and then after everybody else gets a chance, they can come back to the microphone and start the whole thing over. And this had been going on. Have you ever been to an A business meeting? <laughs> Full moon over the loony bin. That's what it sounded like. I'll never forget one man who stood up and said, I don't know what they'll want in next. They'll want, to, I guess they'll want a child molesters group next week. Uh, incidentally, he was from a little town in North Dakota. He never knew anybody gay. Uh, but he had a big opinion on this. In, there were three fellows at the convention. Uh, one from Washington, one from Los Angeles, and one from Chicago, who had gone to visit all the gay groups in their cities. And these were all three straight men. And they had gone to talk to every member they could find in the gay groups to find out what they wanted. And some of the gay groups said they did not care to be listed. They wanted to be something different, not in AA. And some of the gay groups said, we want to be listed. And he said, and in one city, from one city, Philadelphia, the word came back that if we... Um, if it weren't for the gay people in uh, in uh, uh, Philadelphia, we probably wouldn't have an intergroup here because they, we count on them for our, our volunteers more than anybody else. They do more trusted work than anybody else, so we've got to be considered of these people. 
Um, so there was a great deal of feeling that maybe gay groups should be listed on the one hand. Another man got up and said, I don't know why we should have devious groups. And then I recall with great affection the delegate from, uh, from Alaska who was an Eskimo woman, four feet tall. And she ran to a floor microphone, which she could only reach by standing up on her toes like this and yelling up into the microphone. And she said, where I come from, alcoholics are called deviates. <laughs> Yeah, but it didn't end there, and you and I know, deep down in our hearts, it hasn't ended yet. It hasn't ended yet. This is an ongoing story. But to quickly sum up what happened after that at that particular conference, the, there was a strong feeling that this was not the time to take a vote because there was not much consensus on the floor. So the next evening's program was, was scheduled, and the debate resumed at 8 o'clock the following evening, and it went on past midnight. Went on past midnight. I think fatigue was a great friend at that point. Uh, because finally, people were getting so tired, they just wished we could take a vote one way or the other. However, one man, or two, perhaps, uh, uh, had a great deal to do with it, and they were both straight guys. Uh, one of them was a, um, man, the man who wrote the book, um, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. I hope you read that marvelous book. Uh, <clears throat> He's a awfully nice, was an awfully nice great guy, and Niles got up and said, uh, you know, I came into this conference thinking we shouldn't list these people, but the more I listen, the more I think, I'm trying to play God if I don't want them listed. We always say, you remember if you say you are, and who are we to tell them what they should call themselves if they want to be listed? And then a doctor, a non-alcoholic doctor on our general service board, Dr. John B. I, uh, I hope none, nobody here uh, is a good friend of John's because I'm going to insult him. I don't think he ever made another worthwhile contribution in my, <laughs> to the board in the four years he was on it, eight years he was on it, except this. He said, he was sitting in the back, I happened to be at the conference, not because I was a delegate, but because I wrote the, was a writer of the conference report. And um, I had no participation on the floor. And uh, John came over and leaned over to me, I'd known John a long time, and he said, did you people go through this for listing women's groups and young people's groups and stag groups? I said, no, we never went through this. So he went to the microphone, the first time he had ever done that, in seven years ago into the conference, and said, I understand you people didn't do this when you were deciding whether or not to do women's groups and men's groups and young people's groups. Why are you picking on these people? And he went and sat down, and somebody said, let's hear the question. And the vote was 130 to 2. List gay groups. Why not? Um, it will... However, there was a nice, nice follow-up. Um, two little follow-ups. One was, all special interest groups that want to be listed should be listed. Not just gay groups. And the other was, it is hoped that never, never, never would any special interest group exclude any AA member who needs help. Uh, at the New Orleans convention this July the fourth weekend this year, uh, John, the trustee who said uh, who led the fight to get the gay groups listed, at one point was asked, "How can we help gay groups in Chile and Argentina, and in Germany? They were people, gay group, gay members from all those countries there." And uh, John, very sweet guy, sort of stroked his beard. John doesn't have a beard, but he's that kind of man. And uh, thought about it a minute. He said, I think what you better do if you want to get more gay groups and more gay members is infiltrate. Um, in 1972, a, a guy that many of us knew here in New York named Francis uh, moved to Denver, Colorado. And he got to Denver and became one of the most active and valuable volunteers that the Denver Intergroup had ever had. He was the only good accountant they ever had. So they came to depend on him more and more. He was the most dependable telephone answer they had. And eventually, that Intergroup there became so dependent on Francis it couldn't function without him, which is exactly what he was up to. 
And after he went that far, he then said, this was in 1974, he then said to the intergroup steering committee, now, as all of you know, I'm gay. Nobody did. <laughs> and I want to start a gay group, and I count on your support. <laughs> what could they do? What could they do? You know, they swallowed, and they they didn't support Francis, the whole thing, go completely. Go completely. So they said, yes, sir. <clears throat> he was a dominant. And uh, um, there was, as a result of that, when we went to Denver for the 1975 convention, and many of you remember that, there was a hospitality suite, and there were signs all over the place, little unofficial signs, said, live and let live hospitality suite in the uh, Denver Hilton Hotel. And there was in that room... 24 hours a day in Alcathon, gay members from all of the world talking, around the clock. It was absolutely marvelous. As a result, when we got to, Den to um, New Orleans in um, 1980 this year, uh, it had already been decided long before, 1976 it was decided, that um, as one of the people at the General Service Office put it, uh, if gays are not given an official part on the program in New Orleans, they'll just take an unofficial part anyhow. So, um, oh, um, what the heck? Let's put them on big, and they did, as you probably know. There were, there were sessions there with 1,200, as many as 1,200 people. Also, finally, uh, the General Service Office, it became, uh, the started sort of subtly, the grapevine ran a story in which somebody casually dropped the fact she was a lesbian, just sort of casually. Nothing was, no, didn't make any big bones about it. It wasn't about being a lesbian, that just happened to be in the story. And so there, the committees of the, the uh, literature committee of the General Service Board and General Service Conference suddenly came to grips with the problem, should we have stories about people who think they are different, such as gay stories? Well, there happened to be one member of that literature committee who was just waiting. And uh, you've seen the pamphlet, Do You Think You're Different?, which is written especially for, primarily for, gay people. I just wish the uh, gay people who are in there over here tonight. Um, but I'm sorry to say they're not. Seems to me, all the way through the program, a great deal of my life in AA, and has been a case of the membership and the program itself saying to me, go on, take a chance. Go on, you're going to enjoy this. You may not think you are. You may not think you're going to enjoy sobriety, but try. Just give it a try. For heaven's sake, what have you got to lose? Just try. And uh, every time I hung back, I, I thought when I got to A, I would not like being sober, especially since it was predominantly straight. Uh, I was terrified at meetings, and at meetings like this, especially big meetings like this, I'm terribly shy of big crowds. I don't get just, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit timid. I get absolutely constipated with frigid terror um, in a big crowd. And yet, AA has always, in effect, said, well, go on and try. See what's going to happen. Something marvelous might happen. Who knows? I think it can be summed up in uh, eight lines of English verse I read the other day. And I want to invite, if there's somebody here who is fairly new, and may be a little bit overwhelmed at this many of us together at one time, think about this. This little point. The poem is very brief, just as eight lines. Come to the edge. When I fall, come to the edge. It's too high. Come to the edge. And they came, and he pushed, and they flew. My name is Lisa, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm kind of nervous, too. That's why I choked on the word alcoholic. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming to uh, stand here and see. Um, I've never been to a roundup, and um, so it's a little overwhelming to, to stand up here and see what um, can happen 
when people come together to get sober. Um, and I've thought this before, and now I, I know it. It's like you can find anything that you desire in New York City, and even a grand ballroom full of sober, gay, bisexual, and trans people. <clears throat> It reminds me of when I, when I was a kid, I grew up in, in just south of Atlanta, and my father was an airline pilot, and he was also, uh, he's been a member of this program for over 26 years now. And there, I don't know if it's still in existence, but there used to be something called Birds of a Feather, which was basically a special interest group of airline pilots and flight attendants, um, or people in the airline industry um, who are in AA. And, you know, that one was always kept really secret because no, no one wanted to know that there was all these airline pilots who were drunks. But uh, there were a lot of them. And they used to have meetings, you know, a big roundup meeting just like this in Atlanta every year at a big hotel. And I remember I would go because they would invite their families and everything. It was very interesting. And my, my dad was really big in that group. And we would, a lot of times the speakers would stay at our house or something. And... um it was funny because I was just talking to my dad before I came in here for thanks, calling him for Thanksgiving, and um, he knows that I'm speaking at a roundup thing tonight. But I don't think he really comprehends what the special interest is. You know, there's some things that are just left, you know, better unsaid. It would be a very long conversation. But anyhow, this is about alcohol, so that's what we're going to keep it to. And speaking of that, um, we were discussing before we came on stage of, you know, keeping your story to alcohol. But I have to start my story uh, with another substance because my first drug that I used, and I guess my first drug of choice, was gasoline. And when I was a little kid, or I, I was probably around 13, and where I grew up in the South, in Fayetteville, Georgia, um, I was also a little boy then, in case you didn't get that part, but all little boys... In Georgia, thank you. Um, all little boys in Georgia have dirt bikes, and I had a dirt bike too. And um, so one of my friends heard on the news that some kid died from huffing gas. Well, we didn't really look into the part of where he died. We just understood that if you huffed gas, you were going to get high. So we all decided that we would give this a try. And not until I got sober did I realize that this was such a, a beginning of, of addiction for me and the way that I did it. Um, because even at the age of 13, you know, we would all go out in the woods riding on our dirt bikes and, you know, someone would be like, oh, let's huff gas now. And we would all start huffing gas and you would literally put your mouth on the gas tank of your motorcycle and you would inhale like as much of the fumes as you could get. And it would really mess you up. And about the third or fourth time I did it, um, I, I woke up and I was lying on the ground and my motorcycle was on top of me and the gas was like going all over me, you know, and I had just blacked out and passed out right there. And we decided to do it again the next day. So it kept going on and on until the point to where I found myself, my mother caught me in the garage around 8 o'clock at night by myself huffing gasoline and I was 13 years old and, and being that my dad was in the program and you know my brothers and sisters grew up in the 70s she knew that this was not good so she got me to church and <clears throat> church did keep me out of gasoline for a long time but before I got there I had two other instances and the, the second one was I went down to the woods to Rodney's house to ride my motorcycle and I was just by myself hanging out and I just decided to get high in the woods by myself and then ride my motorcycle. And again, I woke up from passing out or a blackout, whatever it was, and I, I knew that my face was hurting really badly. And I, but I couldn't see anything, but I knew it was bleeding, and my motorcycle was, like, broken. So I had to walk home, and I walked into the house, and my grandmother's there in the living room. And all she says when she looks at me, she's just like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And that's when I realized that I had taken all the skin off of my chin by running into a tree on my motorcycle. And I had no idea what had happened. 
But I, it didn't stop me. And now being sober, I look at this behavior and I'm like, oh my God, I was just totally addicted to it and completely out of control. I had no control over huffing gas. And so the last time I did it, um, my mom had had me really involved in church and all of this stuff. So I had all this like religious stuff going on in my head. And I <laughs> went back to Rodney's house and Rodney was cutting the grass. And I had to wait for Rodney to get done cutting the front lawn so we could go ride our motorcycles. And I decided while I was sitting in Rodney's garage that I would just take a couple of hits off his gas can. And I don't know, I heard someone talk about this in a meeting a while back, and this definitely happened to me. I, I think sometimes with alcohol, you know, you can start to get a reverse tolerance to where, you know, after you've been drinking forever, um, you have one drink and you black out. Well, that's what had started happening to me. So I had one good huff, and I started hallucinating. And I, I literally had this hallucination that the gasoline, the liquid itself, went was pouring into my mouth, and I couldn't stop it. And I could see into my stomach, and the gas is like flowing in my stomach. And the thoughts of God and Jesus and everything else that was being taught to me in Sunday school just like flashed into my head. And I really, really thought that I was going to die. And, you know, I don't know if I can consider that a white light experience or whatever, but it scared the shit out of me. And I did think that I was going to die. And it got me out of that, and it got me into church <laughs> um, for the rest of my teenage years. So, moving on, um, I, I got involved in my youth group and all this kind of stuff. So, th I was in like a really safe environment all through my teenage years. So, nothing, nothing bad really happened um, as far as drugs and alcohol were concerned. And I wanted to be an actor, so I moved to New York. So, fast forward like 10 years. So I get to New York, and I actually had written these little notes, and I'm not really going to stick to it because I want the, um, just the spirit to feed me, um, flow through me. But I just wanted to read you this one thing because this afternoon when I was trying to write down points of interest, I realized how boring drinking really is because I wrote, uh, I moved to New York, played in bars and drank, did summer stock and drank, went on tour and drank and drank some more. <laughs> that was basically like a brief history of my um, my drinking history. But anyhow, what the, basically what it, what my situation was? I moved to New York. I was very young. I was only 20 at the time. And uh, but you know, in New York, it didn't matter. You could you can drink whenever you want, wherever you want. And I was also a musician. I still am a musician. Um, and my job basically from the time I was 20 until I was 28 years old was playing guitar in bars and singing like Hootie and the Blowfish and Leonard Skinner. Um, I was still a boy then. It was easier. Um, and, the, you know, it didn't seem alcoholic to me at the time because I, I lived way uptown on Dykeman Street. I had this little studio apartment for like $350 a month, and I didn't need to make very much money. I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have any stuff. So I could just go down to the bars a couple of nights a week and play, and they would give me free booze. And I just drank and drank and drank, and I would get in a cab and go home, and the next day <clears throat> I would consider going to an audition because I moved to New York to be an actor. Well, that kind of, again, once I got sober, I realized how this pattern was starting to prepare me for, for true hardcore drinking. And um, during this time, too, is when I also, I had the whole gender thing going on my whole life, too, you know, and it was very, very closeted for me. And when I lived way uptown, you know, I could get drunk by myself and, like, you know, dress up in whatever things I could find at Dwayne Reed, you know, anything I could buy that people, the checkout lady wouldn't really make the connection that I was a trans person. Oh, it's crazy. Um, so anyhow, I would get drunk and dress up in my apartment because there was so much shame attached to it, you know? And that's where my alcoholism and, and my gender stuff really came in, you know, it came together in a way that my alcoholism fed off of that shame, you know? Anything that could make me feel bad, my alcoholism really wanted me to delve into that because it would just cause me to drink more. So anyhow, I did that for a long time. I was also 
I was acting and going away and doing summer stock and all of that stuff. But, you know, it was always everything in my life um, led to a drink, a drink after the show, a drink after rehearsal, a drink before the show, um, you know, whatever, whatever it took. So I, I'm, I then get the big job, right, the big acting job, and I go on the national tour and all of that stuff. And I realized when I wrote down my drinking history, um, I think I drank every single night of that tour. And it was this thing that I had worked all of my life for, you know, and I got this big gig. And I think about it now. And basically all I did was, like, do the show and then sit in hotel bars and drink. And I was in every, like, city in America, you know. I was getting to see the country. And all I saw was basically, you know, glasses of bourbon um, in my hotel room. So that is a good example for me to remember because it shows me just how pathetic and tragic drinking is for me. Like if I drink, that's what happens. It's just I shut down and nothing is important. Nothing is, is anything. There's no emotion. That's, you know, for me, that's where drinking always takes me to shut down with no emotion. That's a, that's a comfortable place for me to be, but it's not a very healthy place for me to be. Um, so anyhow, I come back from this tour, and, and I think that's when my drinking became every single day. I, I switched. You know, I didn't drink beer anymore now. I was drinking, you know, whatever hardcore, you know, alcohol I could get my hands on. And also, this is the time when somehow, I don't know, I did have some clarity about the gender stuff, and I started coming out um, with all of that, and I was at that time just cross-dressing or going out in drag, you know. Um, and I also put in my notes in here, you know, I thought I thought that I had to get drunk to do that, you know, because there was so much shame involved for me, and, and it was so scary that I thought, oh, I need to have a couple of drinks before I go out, you know. Luckily, in sobriety, I realized that that was ab- absolutely the wrong thing for me to be doing. Um, but I come back, that, and, and I decided after a year or so of being back, that I I was transgender and I needed to transition. And this was like the biggest decision of my life at the time. Um, I went to the Colin Lord Center and I got my evaluations and all of that stuff. And they gave me the okay to start hormones. And this was the first time I ever thought that I shouldn't drink because they did tell me that, you know, well, you can't drink alcohol while you're doing this. I mean, it's very hard on your system. And I was like, okay, you know, it definitely scared me, but I was like, all right, I can do that. You know, I'm really going to take care of myself now because this is what I need to do to to be happy and all of that stuff. So um, I got my hormones and I quit drinking for a week. And um, I think, yeah, probably about seven days into it, I'm sure I washed down my estrogen and Provera with a glass of vodka. And that just sent me on a big spiral of, of depression. Um, you know, doing hormone therapy is, is a little bit crazy um, to begin with. And then if you pour alcohol all over the top of it, it gets really crazy. So I was running out of money. I was, you know, I was doing all of the things that we do when our lives become completely unmanageable. Um, you know, I think about the time I, I have a... a a, a modest little two-bedroom apartment in Midtown that I got years ago, and the rent was really cheap and all that, and it was a great deal. Well, I got to the point to where I couldn't afford to be there. So I took everything that I owned, and I crammed it into the back bedroom and rented the rest of the apartment out, and I lived in this little box in the back room and still continued my life of, like, drinking. And, and also, too, I should say, when I was going out and partying and all of that stuff, you know, when, when I first started coming out because I, I thought I had to go downtown and be with the drag queens to be a trans person. So anyhow, my expenses were, like, crazy. And I never thought, well, maybe I should stop drinking and going out every single night to save a little money instead of living in a box and drinking myself to sleep every night. But, you know, this... Those thoughts, they they really never even occurred to me. That wasn't the problem. You know, the problem was my apartment cost too much. Um, So after after a couple of years of that, 
I decided, a friend of mine who I met when I first moved to New York, we always had this saying, we were all performers, and we said the first person who uh, makes it big is going to buy a house up in the hills, and we're all going to go live there. Well, one of our friends made it really big, and they bought a house in Tuxedo, New York, in Tuxedo Park. And um, Tuxedo Park, too, is not the place you're going to find trans people. But, um, but I went there, and I loved it. It was really fun. I was actually even inv invited to the club one night where they have their dinner on Wednesday night, and I showed up in a dress, and that was the last time that I was asked to come to the club. But it was nice. Um, so anyhow, I got there, and again, I decided I wasn't going to drink. Uh, this time it only lasted for like three days. Um, but what happened in that situation was um, I had got myself into a place. It was like the relocation thing, which I didn't I never heard that either until I came into the to the rooms. So I relocated myself up there because now New York was the problem. You know, everything around me was the problem. I was not the problem. So I went up there and the problems continued. And in fact, now I didn't have to pay rent I didn't buy groceries. All I had to do was get up in the morning, get on the train, go to my little job, and then go back home. And then I had this great, great gift come to me because my now famous friend was on the Tony Danza show, which I think lasted for like three episodes, but he was on the first episode. And Tony Danza decided to send my friend uh, two cases of this vodka, uh, uh, Russian vodka. Now, my friend is also a member of this program, so my friend doesn't drink, but they thought, oh, we're rich people now. We have a big house. We should just keep that in the garage, and if we ever have company, you know, oh, my gosh, already? Oh, i got to speed this up. So anyhow, long story short, I sat in their bedroom, and I drank all of their vodka for, like, nine months. That's what I did. And the little cat, Mr., that they had there, Mr. became my friend, and he would come and sit with me every night when I would be drinking. And I'll say this part, too. I'm, I'm sorry. I really ran over time here. But this whole time, too, I was trying to become, you know, the big first, like, tranny rock star to get a record deal. But <clears throat> long, that's, that's another story. But as I would sit there watching the Logo channel and all of my other friends who were, had their music videos on Logo now, and I would just sit there and drink and wonder, why, why am I not on the channel yet? Why am I not famous? Blah, blah, blah. And every night around 10.30, I would start crying, and I would be sitting in there by myself, drinking my friend's vodka, and Mr., who was sitting in my lap and used to love for me to pet him, would eventually get to the point to where he would just look at me, and he would think, my God, you are so pathetic. <laughs> and he would get up off the bed and walk out of the bedroom and not speak to me for the rest of the night. And you know what? That is what alcohol did for me. Not even a fucking cat would have the time of day for me because I was so pathetic. That's all I did. That's my alcohol got me to a, this very, very small, dark room where I simply sat there and I drank booze. And it was, it was gross and pathetic and lonely and sad. And I don't do that anymore. And I don't do that because one day, through the grace of God, April 1st, 2006, I woke up and I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm sick of my life. My life sucks and I'm tired of it. And I'm, for, for the first time in my life, I realized it's because I drink myself to sleep every single night and I am shut down. There is nothing going on inside of me. And I went to a meeting. I went to a, a woman's meeting at the center and it just opened my eyes. I knew where I needed to be. I knew from my father's experience of being in this program that I could get better and I could change my life. And I'm running out of time now. I'm sorry I focused too much on what sucked about it and not what is so good about it now. But I will tell you now, just to wrap it up, in a year and a half of being sober, I got a sponsor who is here. Um, paid a ridiculous amount of taxes and just cleared it up, something that completely drove me insane. My finances were out of control. I was able to get, um, my debt is still there, but it is in control. Like uh, there is, there is a, a way to take care of it now. There's a real plan that is set in place. And I stopped playing music for now. 
and I started going to college. And I'm enrolled at the borough of Manhattan Community College right now. And it has changed my life to a point. I, I don't even know what's going to happen in my life now. I used to sit back and drink coffee every morning and think about where I was going to be in six months or like a year. I don't even try now because every day I wake up and there's something new that's interesting or enlightening to me. And because I'm sober and a member of this program, I know that it's possible. I know that I have to work my ass off to make anything happen. But that's fine because I want to do that now. I want to wake up and do something because sitting in a room by myself, shutting down and drinking and just being a complete waste of space does not interest me anymore. But I have a disease called alcoholism that wants me to do that that. And, you know, there is no other way for me to do it than to show up and be here and be a part of you, be here with all of you and be a part of this. And I'm completely honored that you asked me to be here tonight. And one more thing, and I'll stop, I promise. Um, I was thinking about this today, too. The GLBT community, because they wanted to ask a trans person to be here tonight to speak. And I just want to show my gratitude towards the gay and lesbian community for always including us because being trans is a very small, small community and it's very hard for us to get our voice out there. And I am probably have to be one of the most luckiest trans people in the world, along with Jennifer and I'm sure a few others who are here tonight, to be able to come to New York City and there is gay AA where they allow trannies to be exactly who they are and what they need to be. And I'm very grateful for that. Thanks for letting me speak. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.